All right, good evening. I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Lakewood City Council in Lakewood, Colorado on September 11th, 2023. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody who is here in chambers. Certainly, if you're joining us online, we welcome you as well. The dial-in number tonight for the hybrid portion is 720-707-2699. And we have uh, the same passcode for that dial-in as your webinar ID on Zoom, which is 849-5732-0840. And you'll press pound twice to get into the meeting. And then if you wish to speak, you can press star nine. So with that, I would ask the clerk to please call the roll. Paul. Here. Olver. Mayaguerrero. Me Here. Stewart. Here. Franks. Here. Strom. Here. Jansen. Here. Charzai. Here. Springsteen. Here. Vincent. Here. Councillor Abel. Councillor Abel's absent. Mayor Paul, you have a quorum. Okay. Thank you. So next on our agenda is the pledge and certainly we'll rise if able in a minute and we will remain standing for a moment of silent prayer and certainly today a moment of remembrance as it is 9-11 and we remember what happened on that terrible day and honor all those that were lost. But we have a special opportunity tonight with uh, our friends from Boy Scout Troop 748 who have come to uh, join us and they're gonna lead us in the pledge. And they're also going to come down and introduce themselves, tell us where they're from. And so this is a great opportunity to have you here. So please come on down. So just come right up here to the mic. And also let us know what badge we're working on. Um. So we're Troop uh, 748, we are in the Green Mountain General Area, and we meet on Jewel and Alameda at L uh, Lutheran Church of the Masters, and um, we are currently working on the Communication Merit Badge, for which is uh, Eagle required. It's great. And you are? I'm Jasper Prince. I am SPL of Troop 748. Great. Where do you go to school? I go to Green Mountain High School. All right. And tell us who, who your colleagues are. Okay. So this is Hunter. But if you want to. Yeah. Go ahead. Come on. Stay where you school. My name is Hunter, and I go to Green Mountain Great. High School. I'm Ryan, and I go to Dunstan Middle School. I am Tobias, and I go to Dunstan Middle School. I am Turner, and I go to Manning Middle School. I am Rowan, and I go to Colorado Preparatory Academy. All right, well, we had the opportunity to meet for a half hour before, and great questions. Ms. Hodson joined us for a little bit. Uh, questions about development, about budget, about city priorities. It was a really great conversation, and I think one of the best questions What's your favorite color? So that's always a, that's always an easy one. So thank you. And because it's communication, I made sure that they knew that public comment is always full of great communication for those of you that come to city council meetings. So they're going to be hanging out. So if you are able to rise, please rise, and uh, we'll have these folks lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and we'll remain standing for a moment of remembrance and prayer. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Nicely done. All right. Next up, we just have our statement of conflict of interest. Um, if any council members have a conflict, 
please go ahead and let us know. And if you'd like to be excused, there's an opportunity to be voted on that. And next up is a special opportunity. So I'll ask the clerk to please read item five. Item five, proclamation honoring Congressman Ed Promoter. This is it. This is it. This is the team. Well, this is really special, and it's been a couple months coming, but I know there's been a lot of honoring, and uh, we want to make sure you could get back into the private sector and have a life and okay. enjoy all that. But it's super meaningful for me to be able to be part of this because for so many years, you honored so many people in our community. And at every event we would go to, you'd take the time to read somebody's special achievement into the congressional record, and your staff was just so amazing. So we're going to honor you tonight, honoring Congressman Ed Perlmutter with a lot of whereases. So we'll start with whereas. Ed Perlmutter is a former member of the U.S. House of Representatives who served eight terms representing the 7th Congressional District of Colorado and during that time honorably represented the city of Lakewood. And whereas Congressman Perlmutter served our military veterans community with distinction in making sure they were recognized for their highly valuable contributions to the freedom of our nation. And whereas Congressman Perlmutter was an important advocate for the mission of the National Renewable Energy Lab and in securing critical funds for the new United States Geological Survey <laughs> Office, bolstering the scientific and research capabilities of our region. And whereas Congressman Perlmutter secured significant funding that improved the transportation infrastructure throughout the district, including his steadfast advocacy for the much needed 6th and Wadsworth transportation funding, which has recently come to fruition and will be greatly improve the city's transportation infrastructure, connectivity, and benefit the safety of our community. And whereas Congressman Perlmutter has been an instrumental force in making healthcare facilities better in our community through his unwavering support of the Ortho Colorado Hospital and St. Anthony Hospital, which have provided essential medical services and improved the overall well-being of the region. And whereas Congressman Perlmutter's leadership and dedication played a pivotal role in assisting with the transition and sale of the federal property in West Lakewood, ensuring that this valuable land is repurposed for the future benefit of our community. And whereas the success and impact of Congressman Perlmutter's service to the city of Lakewood, Colorado, would not have been possible without the tireless efforts of his dedicated staff, who are always accessible, responsive, and committed to improving the lives of his constituents, demonstrating exceptional professionalism, dedication, and a deep sense of public service. And whereas, in addition to his many accomplishments in public service, um, Congressman Perlmutter will forever be remembered for his secret talent, his famous cartwheels, ah. which brought smiles and levity to seriousness of his duties and responsibilities. You can do one if you want. Yeah. Now, therefore, on behalf of the City Council and the people of the City of Lakewood, I, Adam Paul, Mayor of the City of Lakewood, Colorado, declare in recognition of Congressman Ed Perlmutter's outstanding career that the City of Lakewood, Colorado proudly honors Congressman Ed Perlmutter on this day to celebrate his many efforts and accomplishments during his eight terms of honorable service in the U.S. House of Representatives and does hereby extend its heartfelt gratitude for his dedication and service to the 7th District. Mm -hmm. Do you want a mic? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Just for a second, I just want to thank uh, you, Adam, and the council for this really nice uh, memorial. I guess it's not a memorial, I'm not dead. Um, <laughs> this nice honor. Um, and I want to just, you know, the city of Lakewood uh, was sort of central to all of the communities that I represented, whether I was in the state senate or in the Congress of the United States. and. You know, to be able to represent our neighborhoods and to see them, you know, develop, advance, and, you know, take care of people and work with people and give them opportunities to succeed is what it's all about. And I love my job. I love being in Congress. It's a place where there are a lot of clashes, but you can make 
a big difference. And I just want to thank all of you because it's not easy to be an elected official these days. It's a noble calling. You can make a big difference in people's lives. And I just want to thank all of you. And I want to thank everybody in the audience for showing up and being good citizens and taking the time to, you know, and for you uh, in the Boy Scouts, uh, for you to take the time to come down here and participate in the way that you have, because that's what makes it work. So, you know, Kathy, it's just been wonderful working with you and, and all of your staff. But I'll, I'll end it with this. You're only as good as the people you work with. And I work with the best in America. Our office was second to none. And my chief of staff, Danielle Radovich, is here on behalf of the rest of my staff. And she is now a very big muckety-muck at the University of Colorado. So she, she gained after she left uh, our office. Uh, but I work with great people. I had an opportunity to make a difference for our communities and our neighborhoods, and um, I wouldn't have traded a second of it. So thank you very much. Oh, I'll mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I'm not in politics anymore, so I don't have to do any more cartwheels. <laughs> Very nice. Well, thank you. And, and Danielle reminded me that Dion came in after her. So I guess we can give some credit of Coach Prime that way. All right. Anything? Anybody want to touch on that? Okay. If not, we will move forward to public comment. And uh, this is the point of the meeting where the public is invited to address the City Council on items that did not appear on the agenda. All comments should be directed to City Council. I ask that all persons calling in observe the decorum of City Council chambers, whether you're in person or online. Um, everybody will have a three minute opportunity to speak. The timer in front of you will be green and then at 30 seconds go yellow and then your time is up, it'll go red and I'll politely try to wrap you up. And if you are online, when you hear your first ding, that is 30 seconds and then you'll hear two more to go ahead and close you out. And if you are online and wish to get in the queue, please do so now. And it looks like we also do have a pooling of time also. So we'll go ahead and start with Nancy Stoka. Oh, please. So just come on down here and um, we'll get your time started. Welcome. Okay, thank you for this opportunity to speak. I am Nancy Stalker, an amateur wildlife photographer from Denver, Lakewood photographer Frank Kempens, uh, Fred Kempens, encouraged me to speak because he is unable to attend. I was shocked to see that the developer will provide at 777 South Yarrow Street will provide for a parking lot instead of increasing the amount of parkland. Every square inch of Belmar Park will be impacted by the number of park users from this development. Wildlife photographers come, from, uh, come here from places like Estes Park, Longmont, Lamar, and Silverthorne because of this special and fragile park. From the gazebo, the herons and cormorants Courting, nesting, and raising young happens at eye level, a photographer's dream. But there is much more, a huge turtle taking a land route to another area of water, a fox reflected in the water as it prepares to take a drink, or a wood duck with babies uh, can surprise and delight the early morning photographer. And there's behavior to record, such as a female spotted sandpiper prancing and flapping her wings to attract the several males who will build nests for her eggs and raise her chicks. Our seasons at Belmar, other seasons at Belmar provide wonderful opportunities. You may ask whether supplying photo subjects for non-residents is Lakewood's job. Of course, you have your own photographers too, but photographers who come from far away eat and stay nearby and 
uh, to get to the park by dawn. After photog photographing, those who live in local towns may visit Lakewood King Supers, Whole Foods, and uh, Home Depot to uh, save them driving later in the day. A cup of coffee in Lakewood is also a common pleasure. The 542 planned internal parking spaces in the upscale development indicates how residential residents will travel. The city should at least require each internal parking space to have an electric charger to encourage residents to clear the local air by owning electric cars. Every time we eliminate a tree or pave over a grassy area, we increase the intensity of global climate change. The fact that we had a good year for rain shouldn't dull our awareness of the need to preserve and support green and natural areas wherever we can, not pave them over. Our future depends on it. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna get that out. We're gonna, if you wanna clap from now on, we're just gonna go ahead and do that, thank you. All right, Ms. Gies, and then maybe Carl. I have a West Virginia, 8370. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I do have, first, before anything, since this is 9-11, I have a poem that I was gonna uh, read that I wrote the day after uh, the Twin Towers were hit. I thought I would just share it with everyone because it is still very appropriate. <clears throat> it's called, Please Hold My Hand. Please hold my hand. Please don't let me go. I'm kind of scared right now, as you already know. I heard on the news, on the TV today, two towers in New York have all gone away. Will this happen right here? Will this happen again? I don't wanna leave. Please don't let it begin. If this is a fact, what makes them choose? Who will win the battle, or even more, who will lose? We didn't even know them. We never saw their face. What right do they have to come to our place? It sure makes you wonder just how safe you, we really are to use a plane as a bomb. Will they next use a car? If, you, if we welcome our neighbor to our country to live, how much are we offering? How much should we give? Can you protect us from evil? Can you protect us from bad? Can you, you say that we're safe, God? This makes me so sad. I want to believe that my kids are all free, that my granddaughters can play, that no evil they'll see. How can I protect them to assure they're okay? I don't feel it is possible. I can't do that today. So what do we do? We must stand up so tall. We must not allow this from other countries at all. As we strengthen our hearts, as we strengthen our will, we should show the whole world that we are stronger yet still. We are not defeated as the enemy does hide. We shall stand even taller with United States pride. God bless America. Thank you. Thank you. I um, have just a very simple request. I, live over by Carmody Middle School. And for the last 25 years, I have walked my dog around the park behind where the lake is. And I had a phone call with uh, Kyle Doyle, Dolly, Dolly, with Parks and Rec a couple weeks ago about cutting down the weeds that are back there. They are taller than my tall dog, which is my grand dog, which is a yellow lab. And my dog is only this tall. The fact of the weeds being so bad over there as well as over at the stone house, I was wondering if there's any possibility because Mr. Kyle had told me that we are only gonna get that mode once every three years. Now, once every three years, they have not already done it uh, this year at all. And it was a couple years ago before uh, that they did it. So with the fact of all the mosquitoes West Nile and such, and a neighbor of mine, a friend of mine, 
is 85 years old. She backs up to that. She's afraid of fire as well. So this is my request. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like Ms. Oglesby. I think I got that. And then maybe Mr. Larson. Mrs. Larson. Mrs. Larson. And then Mrs. Reitz. Hello. Good evening. I'm Carla Oglesby. Uh, I live at the park, Belmar Park, 8370 West Virginia Avenue. I've lived there for 20 years. And walking around the other day, I was handed a flyer by a woman that was also walking about a proposed apartment building right there at the Iron Gate complex for, for 412 units and cutting down 69 mature trees. So myself and a number of my neighbors are here to find out information about that development and also to find out how we can oppose it. Um, whether we have legal rights as residents, if there will be any studies done to the environment and the impact of the traffic, the huge number of accidents already at Wadsworth and Alameda, and the additional number of cars that would be associated with 412 units could be over 500 more vehicles in this beautiful, pristine park area. So we are wondering how and when the public will be notified about this development, if we have a chance to petition to uh, oppose it. We need legal recourse on how to proceed. And if you could let us know that, or at least let us know when this will be on a item, itemized agenda for the city council. I didn't realize it wasn't tonight. I thought it was. Um, could you let us know? So, and how will we know? <laughs> yeah, no, certainly. So I'll circle back after public comment. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, um, I think that's it. How many times? Oh, I still have time. <laughs> uh, let's see. I mentioned the busy intersection there. We need time to time and uh, guidance on how to petition against this. And uh, if we need to contact real estate lawyers, the planning, the local planning board. I know the growth cap was rescinded which is unfortunate, but uh, it's already such a mess on the streets and there's the extra traffic there. And in addition to those of us who have lived here and enjoyed that park for decades, we would like to know how to preserve that and, and stop this apartment complex at that location. Thank Great, you. thank you. All right, Ms. Larson, Ms. Reese, then Ms. Wilch. Good evening. Do I start? Okay. Yep. Here's Hi, you. my name is Christina Larson, and I live in Villa 2, uh, Village at Belmar. I've lived there for 49 years uh, when they first built the um, apartments or the condos down there. Uh, my mom purchased it. There wasn't even a park at that time. It was just all weeds. The Belmar Mansion um, was, I think, if I remember, still there or just recently torn down. Um, then I moved in. I've been there. I've been there 43 years. My mom, 49, has owned it. Um, I've seen the park grow. Uh, my kids have been raised there. I'm now... Uh, letting my grandkids, I take care of my grandkids there, and they play in all the gazebos, and, and we walk the park, and we see the ducks, and we see the geese, and, and all the animals, and the, the life of nature, and they, um, they, they learn what it's like to, um, to live in a community that really cares about people. And I'm um, wondering, I'm really concerned about this 412 unit that is going to be proposed. Um, I, I would definitely like to fight that. Um, I'm concerned about the traffic. I'm more concerned about the park and that how it's going to become something like Washington Park with too many people, too many dogs, too many animals. Um, I'm concerned about the trees being taken down. I'm concerned about the parking lot. Um, we have cider days over here. We have the heritage buildings over here. Um, and I just, uh, I would like to oppose it. I'm not really much into politics, so I'm not really sure how, but I'd just like to state that um, 
I am interested in finding out what I need to do to stop that from happening. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Reitz. Good evening. Good evening. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. My name is Polly Reitz. I'm the Conservation Committee Chairman for Denver Audubon, uh, the local chapter of the National Audubon Society, with about 9,000 members in um, <clears throat> Den the Denver metro area. So we cover the whole uh, seven county area. Uh, Belmar Park is a place our members like to go to bird. Uh, the Denver Field Ornithologists also uh, have trips there. And others who may not be affiliated with either uh, organization just like to go and watch birds, which is a nice cheap hobby. Um, but first some background, um, before I express our concerns, uh, Lakewood and Belmar Park are part of the Central Flyway, which is um, a migration route used by millions of migratory birds in spring and fall. Um, a multi-agency study published in 2019 discovered that North America has lost 25% of our birds, uh, some 3 billion birds that have just disappeared since 1970. And the loss and degradation of habitat is the biggest driver of these declines. So hence our concern for preserving green space. Um, a check on the Audubon Migration Explorer website uh, reveals that 306 species have been noted or tracked through Lakewood. So it, it does get migratory bird use. Um, <clears throat> and they fly to countries in Central and South America as well as other parts of the U.S. So, major concerns. Uh, first is, of course, loss of habitat. In view of the fact that Denver has warmed 2.9 degrees Fahrenheit so far and is projected to warm by a total of 5.5 degrees Fahrenheit by 2050, cutting down dozens of large trees seems rather short-sighted because of the shade and cooling they provide to help counter the heat and the wildfire danger resulting from climate change. Uh, maintaining every acre of green space possible rather than turning it into a parking lot in lieu of parkland um, is becoming more and more important. We recommend creative planning that saves many more of the trees than just the three that's projected to survive. Another concern, light pollution. Uh, improper lighting can disorient birds and other wildlife like insects, bats. Um, <clears throat> the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has recommendations for best practices. If I have a copy of their uh, document here, uh, such as making sure the light focuses down rather than out. Windows and glass surfaces are another concern, and we recommend that you encourage or require window treatments that birds can see to avert collisions. At landscaping, please require native landscaping everywhere you can um, that support native birds and insects. Please no ginkgos or chanticleer pears, which are a desert for our native species. Uh, we have other concerns with like the residents have expressed already, so I'll stop there. Um, can I hand to you this, uh, or would, do you want it? Sure. This is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife document. You want to give it to the Good clerk, help. make sure he gets copies. Okay, of it. Thank great. you. Thank you so much. Yep, appreciate you. Miriam? And then Ben, are you on this and housing, or just? Okay, you're up next. And then Jenna. Hi. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm here to talk about Love Lakewood Day. I talked a few weeks ago at City Council and I've sent you all emails, um, but I'm here to talk and hopefully get you to volunteer. So on September 23rd, Serve Spot Lakewood is hosting the first Love Lakewood Day, a citywide volunteer day. Um, we will have part um, projects throughout the city and have um, committed community members volunteering. Um, so from nine to noon, We'll have projects with something for everybody to do. We have a mural painting at Mount Air Park in coordination with the city and West 40, 40 West Arts. We'll have a trash pickup on 14th Avenue in coordination with the Two Creeks Neighborhood Organization and Mount Air Church. Um, a food delivery with benefits in action. Painting projects at four elementary schools, Divini, South Lakewood, uh, Slater, and Iber. 
uh, beautification project at Lakewood High School with um, and at the Lakewood World War II Memorial at the high school. Um, and then a, a Meals of Hope event at Southwest Community Church. And then also an at-home volunteer opportunity. Um, folks can cook for recovery works and donate food to them. Um, so if you want to sign up, you can go to servespotlakewood.com. Um, and I would love to see you volunteer there. And then um, yes, thank you. Great, thank you. thank you. Nicely done. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, friends. I come before you this evening not only as a pastor to the people of Lakewood and the congregation of Lakewood United Methodist Church, but also as a member of the board of directors for the Community Investment Alliance. We are a nonprofit in the state of Colorado focused on e equity, opportunity, and the collective flourishing of all people. Our staff are some of the foremost experts and practitioners on the best trauma-informed approaches to serving people experiencing homelessness in the state of Colorado, as well as being advocates and for and developers of affordable housing in multiple regions of Colorado. We just celebrated our first anniversary this year, a month ago, by recognizing leaders that we see in Colorado who are change agents in the continuous struggle to increase access to affordable housing and to make homelessness rare, and when it does occur, brief and non-recurring. One such person we recognized, though he could not make it to our gala, to be celebrated is our mayor of Lakewood, Adam Paul. Now, I wasn't surprised that we selected him. Others there told stories of his advocacy for impacted communities at Dr. Cog meetings and his courageous stance against growth caps in our state. But what I remember is a cold night after a frustrating city council meeting in January where I suddenly get a call on my cell phone with the frustrated Adam Paul on the other line asking me at 11.30 p.m. if our church had a van. And if so, could we use it to get anyone we could find that was out in the street and in the deadly cold to a Motel 6 where we could voucher them into rooms. It was terrible timing. Um, I was just at the tail end of my parental leave after the birth of my daughter, but I was glad he interrupted my quiet evening today because we ended up getting more than 12 people off of the street that night between the two of us. And every night that we can get people off of the streets in cold like that is a night where lives are saved, period. So I now formally and in person and sorry, a month after the actual event, would like to present our mayor with the no, Community kind. Investment Alliance Community Leadership Award. Mayor Paul, thank you for always honoring the humanity of everyone you meet including so many whose humanity is often ignored or forcefully denied them. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I'll circle back. Sorry. Good evening. Good evening. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Jenna Halleck with Colorado Christian University. Good to see you tonight, Council. Uh, just a quick, in addition to what I wanted to share from Jeffco EDC, we had our new student service day on Friday, and we had over 400 students serving just right here in the community. And one of the really neat things that came out of that was a partnership with Creighton Middle School thanks to their leadership on their parent-teacher organization and support from their administration. We were able to do some trail cleanup and uh, mulching a high-use student path. So CCU students were able to work side-by-side -side with middle school students, and that was a really special part of that day. So thank you to Creighton leadership for making that happen. So what you see on the slide here, I know it may not be easy to read, so I will highlight those highlights that are bulleted there. Uh, special thank you to Jeffco Economic Development Corps for their work in putting this together for us, especially Jansen Tidmore and Lee Seeger, uh, who are working diligently uh, to improve the economics of our city. We're grateful for their work, and we are proud to be a part, of course, as always, of the city of Lakewood, as well as uh, Jefferson County in general. So here we have an economic impact report of CCU. First, our campus investment and also the economic impact of our jobs. So uh, I'll just read those highlights for you and then I will step away from the mic. 
An estimated $168 million has been invested at CCU's campus here in Lakewood. Construction from these projects has accounted for the creation of over 1,200 direct, indirect, and induced jobs in the region. The total wages from the construction jobs were over $92 million, and collectively, these construction jobs contribute nearly $198 million to the region's gross regional product. The economic impact of our jobs to date, CCU has an estimated 386 full-time employees with an average salary of just over $69,000. Uh, I'll just skip down to uh, the additional impacted jobs accounting for 458 total and total wages nearly three uh, excuse me, $33 million. So collectively, CCU employees contribute over $67 million to the region's gross regional product. So again, we're so grateful to be here in Lakewood, to be part of this community and uh, the county in general. And again, thanks to Jeffco EDC for their work on putting this report together for us. Great, thank you. Uh, and forgive me, Barbara Molman. And then Linda stop. And then Elizabeth. Oh, take your time. Okay. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak before you. I'm Barbara Millman, and I live. Uh, I've lived in. Lakewood for 30 years and uh, Ward 2 and there you are. <laughs> um, this will take a second. One of the true jewels of the city of Lakewood Park system, Belmar Park, is a peaceful enclave in the center of town. That is a direct quote from the City of Lakewood's website describing Belmar Park. I agree, and I know many here do too, and many more. I visit it often because it's my sanctuary away from the rush of city life and noise. The majority of people I encounter there are friendly and appear happy. I am happy too, walking my dog on its well-worn paths, spotting at a pond's edge, turtles lined up on a log facing the sun, further away seeing Canada geese parade down the center of Kuntz, I don't know how to pronounce it, Kuntz Lake, nesting cormorants content on a little island, and a giant blue heron taking off for points unknown. The park, even during the pandemic, was never overrun with people. It helped get so many of us through the pandemic. The park is indeed a, quote, peaceful enclave in the center of a town, end quote. Belmar Park must not become the backyard of a large development of 412 units and as many or more cars. The impact of this dense development adjacent to our park is unfathomable and very concerning to many users. Philanthropist May Bonfi Staten, people who are young may not have heard of her, um, purchased the land that is now Belmar Park in 1936 to protect wildlife on Kunz Lake and the rest of her property. That included 30 mule deer, many peacocks, ducks, and geese. She had Colorado officials approve it as, quote, state license preserve number 557, end quote, where quote, hunting, fishing, or trespassing for any purpose, end quote, quote, were forbidden. The grounds were patrolled by armed security guards. May Bonfi Stanton would be crushed to learn what direction her paradise is now 
about to take. I urge you to use your power to preserve this sanctuary that as it is, oh, that, okay, that as it is makes people happy and critters thrive. I urge you to save Belmar Park. Thank you. Thank you. It's just silent clapping. Yeah. Sign language for clapping, yes. Good evening. Good evening. How yeah. are you? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. Thank you all for your consideration of the presentations you are about to hear. I'm the first speaker of a group called Clean Energy Lakewood. We really care about the future of our city, just like all of you. My name is Linda Stopp, and I have lived in Ward 4 for 22 years. Our advocacy coalition, Clean Energy Lakewood, has provided input to the council on subjects related to sustainability, most recently to request a full department of sustainability in our government, and earlier to request the passage of Amendment 13 to the sustainability plan. Today, we're calling on you to take immediate action to facilitate the capture of Lakewood's portion of the millions of dollars that are coming to our state as both the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure and Jobs Act are implemented. Our own Sustainability Division recently provided an update to Council on energy rebate programs and other incentives that are currently available or will soon be. It is imperative that Lake would take advantage of this monumental opportunity. In order to do so, Lakewood needs to put several strategies in place in advance to accelerate our city's participation in these opportunities. Specifically, we're here to request that you, our city council, mayor, and city manager, create and implement the necessary program to match existing and future rebates offered by Excel Energy and the Colorado Energy Office. This action will provide Lake Woodians more opportunities to breathe the clean air, better manage water resources, and make local clean electricity the main source of energy. I believe our common values are to live in a healthy world where our children and grandchildren are able to enjoy the best a clean and regenerative community can offer. As the stewards, of city resources, your work impacts how we meet our greenhouse gas emissions goals, how we fulfill the objectives of Lakewood Sustainability Plan, and how we demonstrate our commitment to the health and well being of our residents. Please ensure that all Lakewood residents, regardless of social economic status, have access to a matching rebate program and the hands on guidance to learn about and apply for these programs so we Lakewoodians can meet the challenges of climate change and continue to make our great city more beautiful and healthy. Thank you. Elizabeth, come on down. Then I have Robert and then Alyssa. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Paul and members of the City Council. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Molinar and have been a resident of Ward 1 for seven years now. I'm an energy anthropologist and my research focuses on the cultural context of energy production and energy consumption, including environmental justice. I teach sociology and anthropology at Regis University and in my free time, I'm very active in the Sustainable Neighborhood Network. Tonight, I'm here to encourage the, city's, the City Council to commit efforts to the distribution of energy rebates available through federal funding. Two points on why you should put your energy into this. One, people are concerned about their children and future generations and environmental degradation. And two, rebates are wanted and needed. Linda Staub just now was talking about values and doing right by our community and families. Last semester as a professor, I supervised a research project designed and conducted by my students on air quality in Lakewood. 
Part of their data collection involved a short survey distributed on social media and via neighborhood networks. One of the questions on this survey was whether the respondents wanted to have the, the earth better than they found it. I know this question could be formulated differently. However, what people responded to this open-ended question predominantly across uh, income categories and demographics was the concern they had for their children or future generations and environmental degradation. As a commissioner on the Lakewood Advisory Commission, I worked on the recommendations to council regarding turf replacement presented last February. Part of that conversation were rebates as well. I remember there were some questions from council about the financial amount to make available. Since then, the popularity of the rebates quickly outpaced the money allocated for these rebates. I'm bringing this up now to show that there is an interest in water and energy conservation and that there is a need for robust financial support to maximize benefits from programs like these. I urge the City Council to work expediently to direct the available federal funding to Lakewood residents because of the concerns and interests I mentioned, but also because of the economic multiplier effect, improved living conditions, and other implications it has that others here tonight will speak on. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Mr. Youngberg. Lessa and then Neil. Good evening, um, Robert Youngberg. I've lived um, in Ward 4, been here for uh, a little over 30 years. I moved here in 1991. And I'm gonna talk to you this evening primarily about energy conservation and renewable energy, and uh, various technical and financial opportunities in that, in that regard. We've got a lot of slides, so I'll give you a hard, hard copy, and I think you'll also get an electronic copy. But the big thing with, with energy conservation uh, the most important thing is don't use it in the first place. Uh, there's a huge variety of options uh, for reduced energy conservation. conservation. Uh, windows, doors, light bulbs, that type of thing. Uh, upgrading existing systems, replace, excuse me, I need to catch up here. Um, upgrading systems, replace, uh, exi replace existing systems and implement solar PV, my favorite. Uh, there's extensive opportunities, federal, state, local level, and, and also our local uh, utility. Uh, the, the City Sustainability Division has prepared an excellent uh, summary of these various opportunities. It's available on the Lakewood website. There's an extensive list of federal, federal tax credits. Uh, I think I'm behind here. Let me, there we go. Federal tax credits, and that's only actually a, a partial partial list. Uh, Excel also has a, a, a long list on, on their website. I'd be more than happy to click the, uh, look up that um, link and, and take a look at that. A little personal experience is about 27 years, uh, excuse me, about nine years ago we bought, bought a 27 year old house. It looked pretty good, but once I took a look at the energy consumption and the conditions, we decided we had major improvements are needed. Went through a whole bunch of attic insulation, old furnace, uh, water heaters, uh, sidewall insulations, et cetera. Got about a 40% reduction in space heating load, a 30% reduction in, uh, air in electric load, including the air conditioning. Got a notice uh, a couple years ago from Excel saying we'll use 95% less energy than all of our neighbors. And I just got this the other day, uh, that bill from Excel says zero amount due. I think that's, that's good to be, primarily because of my solar system. Uh, just a couple numbers on my solar system. I ran about um, uh, $12,000 to install it, about 9,000. Uh, it produces about 12,000 kilowatts per year. About 9,000 of that goes to household and air conditioning, and about 3,000 for the uh, EV charging. Now, the big savings there is, um, is for, by not burning gasoline and the maintenance on, the, on the, uh, my, the, our old uh, ga gasoline car. So by far the save, biggest savings. Also is by far the biggest carbon savings if you want to take, take a look at those numbers. Um, it's, uh, it's a hu huge savings in that, in that regard. 
Okay, the, um, also I want to uh, re-emphasize uh, re that this is all investment in the city of, city of Lakewood. It provides all kinds of jobs, ta uh, tax incentives, et cetera. And I want to point out to the direct pay provision of the IRA 2022, which allows cities to receive 3% directly into your coffers for tax credits. And so that's that's my presentation. And I'd be more than happy to talk to any of you personally. Great. About Thank it. you. Thank you. Alyssa? And then Neil and then Laurent. Good evening. Good evening. So what if we do nothing? Good evening. My name is Alyssa and I've lived in Ward 4 for 12 years. My husband and daughter are both Lakewood natives. What if we don't take the opportunity to attract this federal funding that could come to Lakewood? What if we let it go to other cities instead? What an opportunity lost. Our residents can't afford power bills as it is and they're only going up from here. Even those who got in before the increased home, price, home prices are faced with increased costs on an income that just can't keep up. That leads to homelessness, of course, reactionary versus our proactive approach. We also won't be able to meet those, <laughs> those goals um, in our sustainability plan. And air pollution. My daughter's already breathing in ridiculous air quality, and that's been happening since her father was a child. Lastly, small business rebates. Um, lastly, these rebates often go to local small businesses, and we can use that money in our local economy. So I'm calling on you to take action and commit efforts to this monumental opportunity. Thank you. Neil, Laurent, and Joshua. Here. Oh, there you are. All right. Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen of the council, good evening. Um, Neil Preister, Ward 1. Colorado uh, Clean Energy Lakewood. Um, the Lakewood Sustainability Plan says that, that sustainability is your second highest priority. Um, according to the Lakewood Sustainability Division, 21% of our emissions come from the uh, single family homes, 21% come from the commercial sector, and 28% come from transportation. That's what's written here. Um, this is our challenge. It's got to go. And it's got to go by 2050, it's got to go to zero. Um, that's 27 years. That may not seem like a long time, but it took us 150 years to generate that emission, ca that, that uh, capacity for emissions. Um, most of, Lake, of Lakewood's greenhouse gas emissions to date um, are, gonna, are coming from Excel's mandated renewable generation. Um, they are greening their, electro, their electrical supply as mandated by law. Um, the remaining reductions come from transportation. There has been no meaningful reduction in Lakewood's greenhouse, emission, greenhouse gas emissions from the existing building stock. There has been no meaningful reduction in Lakewood's emissions from, from Lakewood's existing building stock. Um, the current business model, as usual, is not going to work. Um, Excel's clean energy heat plan as submitted by the Colorado PUC to the PUC on August 1st is loaded with greenwashing to clean up its natural gas supply. They are doing little or no emphasis on beneficial electrification in violation of, of uh, energy flute future collaborative with the city of Lakewood. Um, they are not going to voluntarily help us reduce our, our uh, pollution coming from burning natural gas in our homes. That, that, that's based on on performance, but they are helping with the disinformation campaign. So um, Article 13 in the, of the Enhanced Development Menu says uh, it does not facilitate greenhouse reductions in Lakewood's existing homes. It does not promote beneficial electrification in our existing homes, even during remodeling or heating appliance replacements. Um, so the biggest two costs for reducing uh, hurdles for reducing greenhouse gas emissions are cost um, and lack of political will. Um, the federal tax credits, the available grants for Lakewood, and the planned state rebates are unlikely to move the needle because the costs are so high. Lakewood's residents are going to need help. Um, and they're going to need help to, loot, to uh, lower, their, lower their carbon footprint is for the, the political will. Um, I think the majority of voters in America think that climate change is a serious issue. Um, and if you'd like to Google it, just Google the greatest uh, 
existential threat to humanity. It'll come up climate change every time. I've tried to lay down an argument here that indicates this, the, the, the scope of the problem, where we're going to get help, and that there is, there is a solution to these things. We don't have silver bullets, uh, but we got silver buckshot. There is a way that we're going to solve this problem, and we're going to need the political will of this body to help with that. Um, we would recommend that you consider some form of Lakewood's skin in the game to support these renewable efforts through beneficial electrification. That's what it's going to take. That's the, the best technology going. Um, thanks. Appreciate your help. Good evening, Mayor Paul and City Council. Good evening, I'm Lauren Mayon, resident of Ward 1 and uh, one of the main agitators with Clean Energy Lakewood. So we're coming to you for action, and I want to start with this package here. Uh, this is the Denver Home Energy Rebate Programs, where you can learn about rebate details, how to apply program eligibility, and stacking rebates in particular. Uh, these home energy and electrification rebates can be stacked and combined with rebates from Excel Energy and the Colorado Energy Office funded from the Inflation Reduction Act. And then it gives you a list, uh, electric vehicle, charging at home, air source heat pump, ground source heat pump, mini splits, heat pump water heaters, solar battery storage, electric service upgrade, all these things, m most of which will be paid up to 80% of project cost by the city of Denver. And that's how Denver is going to draw money from the federal and state spigots that are about to flow like huge rivers through our state. Uh, Lakewood's share of that, just in proportion of the population, is over $200 million. So you can have communities like this that are active, they have, they put their money where their mouth is on sustainability, and they're going to draw funds into their communities. Then you're going to have communities that are going to sit there and monitor what's going on and watch the river flow by. And so we, we appreciate everything the council's done over the last six years to try to move sustainability forward, uh, but here we have a triple emergency, uh, the emergency of seizing these funds and our share of them, the emergency of the environmental situation, and so if you're worried about where you could find a million dollars, I suggest you turn to the same place you might have turned when climate change shut down the Colorado Mills more for three years and caused the city to lose tons of millions of dollars instantly in revenue, right? There's a way to keep functioning. We didn't close down the city out of that. So, please, and then this council is also coming to an end in this iteration. Who knows what will happen next and if it will be favorable to clean energy action. So, from both Enviro funding and political opportunity, we ask you to pass some form of emergency measure before you leave this council and this band through the election process to have at least a million dollars of matching fund, and, and matching funds are really simple because you don't have to analyze and recreate the wheel. You can just say, hey, Excel, the state, and the Fed did all this homework. Liquid residents, prove to us you got this help. We'll match it. End of the story. You don't have to create a whole administration or think about it for two years. You can act now and seize the money while it's available. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And then I have is it Gary and Christine Evans, and then Lene James, and then Connie, and then I have another pooling that I'll get to. Good evening. Hello. Uh, last time I was here, I was talking mostly about how we shouldn't be treating people sleeping rough on the streets. Tonight, I want to come a little more positive and say how we could be treating them by way of a story. Uh, a couple months ago, I was flying back from Orlando, and I sat with a guy 
who we talked for three hours on the plane ride back. You know, I learned very quickly that he and I probably don't agree politically on many things. <laughs> but he had a very interesting uh, perspective with me. Uh, he is a tennis coach in Wyoming, and he leases a bunch of um, tennis courts from the city. And near his tennis courts in a park, there's about three or four different unhoused people uh, camped out in the park. And when he bought his business, the guy previous to him said, you've got two choices. You can either do the humane way or the ineffective way. The ineffective way is to call the police and have them get removed. The humane way is to get to know them and try to coexist with them. And that's what he did. Every day that he, he uh, runs his uh, training camp at these park, at the tennis courts, he brings coffee and donuts and walks around and say, you know, finds out like the word on the street, what's going on. He's gotten to know them pretty well. One is wheelchair bound. One is kind of a, a broken down cowboy. The other two I don't remember. But he talked about many different stories. That was mostly what we were talking about over the plane ride is, you know, swapping stories back and forth. Um, but he, 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 you know, even though we don't agree politically, he, he and I agreed very strongly on this kind of way of uh, going about it. He built relationships with them. He could tell me their life stories. Um, he even told me, uh, he, I can tell you one story. Uh, he, he told me he has this shed where stuff could easily be broken into. So one night or one day, one morning, he comes back to his shed and he sees there's like blood on the ground. And he's like, uh-oh, what happened here? And he, he goes around asking what happened. And they said, oh yeah, there's these uh, skater punks trying to break into your shed, but we dealt with them, so don't worry about it. And he was like, whoa, okay, that's pretty intense. But, uh, you know, these are kind of the kind of relationships that you can build with people if you just try to go and meet with them. And in my last 14 seconds, I want to say, uh, Boy Scouts are great. We're scouting now. I had my best memories. Uh, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that, you know, my Eagle Scout project was to build cots for a homeless shelter. So thank you. Cool. Very cool. Thank you. Uh, Sevens, come on down. Mr. or Mrs. Evans? Do I have that right? 616 South. Can't read it. Okay. Lene, is that accurate? Come on down. Then Connie. Good evening. Mayor and Council, thank you for the opportunity. You pull this closer. There you go. Mayor and Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I moved to Lakewood 37 years ago from Aurora, in part because of the parks, in part because of the access to the western part of the e the, we the western part of our state. It undid the good of having been at Glenwood Springs to drive from the edge of the city out to Aurora. <laughs> and I've loved to living here. I have a map here that's from 2011, City of Lakewood Parks and Recreation Areas. And I have sites, I have circled in blue with solid line the area parks that I walk with regularly with a walking group that started from a, from silver sneaker classes at Carmody Rec Center. And it's a drop-in group and f we walk four days a week, come when you can, and on Saturday we walk in Belmar Park. And the circle up there around Belmar Park has a red mark in it, 
and that red mark is the area that is being considered in the future for um, residential use. And there's a little red dot below in the Heritage Center where we do the outdoor concerts. And that residential area is closer than the other residences on that same street when we have our concerts. <laughs> and I'm concerned, uh, we park, we come on Saturday to that park, we alternate through the other ones as we want to, but we come on Saturday there because of being able to park right where the path runs that you can walk around the lake on. And it's a very beautiful part of the park. Um, that white area that was part of the Bonfils estate, it is mansion rather, is um, an area used for photography. And on Saturdays, we've seen wedding parties have their photographs taken there. And I don't say the word for the parties that um, people of Hispanic heritage use for their 16-year-old daughters. But we have seen beautiful, beautiful dresses, beautiful groups of people. And not being Hispanic, it's been a wonderful way of getting to know more about that culture and to talk with people and say that, um, so. My proposal is how can we trade that area that has been used only primarily during business hours and only having parking in it usually during business hours for some other area of this park or a neighboring park. So <laughs> I'm, I'm wanting the people who need the housing to have housing, but I'm wanting the park in that sensitive area to be protected. And I've, when, when, with the Heritage Center, could you, um, could you wrap it the up, parking, please? Thank you. The parking is a big problem, and we need to address that too. Thank right. you. Thank you, thank you. I'm sorry. Well, no, you're, no, you're all right. No, I, I let you go over. Um, but I just want to make sure we still have some more folks. All right, Connie, you're up next. And then I have a pooling, uh, Mr. Durth. Durth. Good evening. Good evening. Is this on? Yes. I've come here today because I have come to this council since 2018. I was a representative of Save Our Section 8 uh, spokesperson in Washington. I know the federal laws, and according to the laws, I have not been uh, treated fairly. I have been discriminated against. And uh, living in um, cityscape and it being run by West uh, Metro Solution, which you are over. And uh, the problem is, is I come in here time and again with doctor's orders and I have been living in an unsafe environment. When you have people from the housing authority go and do an inspection and they say that there is uh, uh, electrical problems, which I've been complaining for four years now, and I've been complaining to you about all these issues that have been going on. And because of this, I have been retaliated against. I told them I wanted it fixed when I paid my rent on the eighth uh, month, the fourth day. And instead of them fixing the problem, I had a notice clipped onto my door saying that uh, my lease wasn't going to be renewed. Well, excuse me, but there are federal laws, and for some reason they think that uh, they're not to follow the federal laws. I've uh, been to uh, 
my uh, Ward 3 people about this issue, and all of you have known this problem that has existed, and you have not done anything about abiding by state and federal law. There's a warranty and habitability law which states that if I'm not living in a safe condition, I'm not even to pay rent. I ask for uh, reasonable accommodations, and I have the excuses that, oh, it has to have the letter heading of uh, the Housing Authority or West Metro. Excuse me, but the federal law exists that if a doctor gives you a notice, he has his own letterhead, and he's asked for a reasonable accommodation today because they said I have to be out by the end of the month without any reason for the purpose of me having to move just the retaliation because I have brought all these issues all up to all, all of you in city council, and nobody has done anything about abiding by federal and state laws. And I want to see what you're going to do about it because you're over West Metro and you talk about helping all these homeless people get off the street. Uh, can you uh, imagine your mother or your grandmother being put out in the streets because they retaliate because she speaks up on the issue of homelessness and uh, advocacy for the homeless and uh, save uh, low income uh, housing and workforce housing? Well, I think uh, it's something needs to be done about this. And I'm putting it to all of you to do something about this now. I've given you a letter from my doctor stating, because of my illnesses and everything, that I'm not able to even move out of my uh, place by the end of this month because of my medical reasons. And it's a reasonable accommodation. And I tried to uh, uh, give this to the Housing Authority and West Metro, and they're like, oh, we, we, we need it on our letterhead. But a reasonable accommodation is good when it comes from a doctor, a social worker, or anybody. So it's time for you to do something about following the federal and state laws. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else in chambers before I go to our pooling? Okay. Come on down. Good evening. Hi, my name is Tom Durth. I live in Belmar Commons in so, Ward 3. Oh, sorry, one. Let's get it. You reset here. Yeah, it's a pool. No, it's not showing up as 10. No, it's 3. Does your. Do you have a timer on yours? Yes, it is. What's this say? Ten, from 10 minutes? They're pooled. That's cool. Okay. We'll get you up. I'm still Tom Durth. <laughs> <laughs> I still live in Ward two, uh, 3. Uh, there you Belmont go. You're Commons. good now. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> Nothing's changed there. So, uh, Mayor Paul, Council, and guests, um, I'm here to talk about the new building. Marshall Fire. Lahaina disaster. And I'm wondering if anybody in this room would be willing to add Belmar to that list. I pretty much doubt that. It was a couple of, about a month ago, I was walking through the park. I love the park. I live across the street from it, and whenever the computer gets to me, I'm in the park. I was walking around, I was looking at all the incredible foliage over there. And after all the spring rains that we had and how beautiful everything is, and uh, you know, there you're in the city, and now all of a sudden you're in the country just by being there. And I was looking around at even horseback riders, and I'm going, this is pretty incredible. A little city boy like me living in a neighborhood with horses. And I was so excited about it, and then I got to thinking about about two months from now, that's going to be fire, firewood. And all we would need is one small spark from the west side of that park and a good wind coming to the east, and we have another Lahaina. I don't think anybody here wants to see that. I don't think anything we could do could ever stop that. But the concern that I have is that we don't really help people figure out how to protect themselves for that. Uh, 
So neighbors, uh, there were uh, six of us that got together and decided to get an evacuation plan for our community. And we decided to have a grab and go bag and tell people videotape everything you have in your house because that's what the insurance company expects you to do. They want you to prove that you had all these different things. And in the grab and bag, grab bag is to have your passports, copies of important information and so on. And as we started working on this list and deciding what it was we needed to warn people to have, we began to think about an evacuation plan. What would we do if there was a fire like that? So we looked at our plan and we said that there's only one, out of the Belmar Commons, which is right across from the library, for those of you who are not familiar with that, uh, there's only one real exit out onto um, Yarrow Street. And we were looking at other ways that the fire department has exits and entrances to that property, how we would be able to get out through those if necessary. And to get to Belmar, and Belmar was never designed to be a heavy traffic street, ever, ever. It was designed as a, a small little residential street. And if we went out one way, we'd go to the south and you'd get to Ohio Street. If you go to the north, you get to Virginia Street. Now, Virginia Street, we have Belmar, or we have Yarrow Street coming in to a shopping center. And from the west, there is the entrance, or there's the, um, um, Virginia Street has the traffic going to the east. And then we also have uh, a parking lot for uh, the um, library and one for the Panda Express and all that stuff coming together. It was like, what would we do? That was pretty confusing. I mean, isn't that, wouldn't that confuse you? Now, add 500 cars to that mess. If there were 500 or more cars parked on Yarrow Street, we're dead. We're not just maimed and we're not just gonna lose houses, but what it's gonna look like, it's gonna look like Lahaina. There's pictures that we had of that. There'd be no way it would be total, absolute chaos. It'd be total, absolute congestion there that we couldn't get out. So it's not only the people in my community that I worry about, but I worry about the people that would be in that proposed building. What would they do? When we brought this up at a street meeting, um, and, and oh, maybe about three weeks ago, I brought this point up, and the answer I got was, well, the new building will have a sprinkler system. What that has to do with uh, Yarrow Street, I don't know, but Yarrow Street is the problem. There's parking on both sides of the street, which narrows it down. If you've ever been around whenever there's an event over at the, uh, the center, uh, you, you know that it's kind of hard to get up and down that street there. Now, the real problem is this. We now have, uh, we've got the, the UPS and the, uh, uh, all the other delivery trucks and everything, the, like um, the Prime and all that, and they drive really fast. And when the, when the traffic is out there and you've got the cars parked on both sides of the street because people from the library use that street, the people from the park use that street, the people from, uh, they even park trucks out there so people can go to Panda Express to get lunch. I don't know why they do that, but they do. And so we've got all these cars out there going fast. These, these drivers are told to go fast. You're supposed to get to the next place, get to the next place, next place. And if we were now to say there's only 70 people living on that block, turn that up to almost 600 people who are shopping online and getting all these new trucks. Plus you've got more garbage trucks coming down that street. Plus you've got moving vans. Plus you've got ambulances. Plus you've got, I mean, it goes on and on and on. Yarrow Street is the problem. And the city of Lakewood says that the three most important things are, are that they want for their citizens is health, safety, and welfare. I wanna know how does any of that have anything to do with safety? I can't understand that at all. How they could even plan on thinking about putting 412 more residences on that narrow little street is beyond me. 
and it really is putting all the lives of the people in jeopardy. If there really was a fire there, the fire department would not be able to get in. And if they got in, they wouldn't be able to get out. And now we're putting first responders' lives at stake. This is something that absolutely is not acceptable to anybody in any kind of community. There's also the situation with um, snow. I'll let you all create your own picture of that one. Because when the snow is there and the street is congested and people are trying to get around and you're trying to get safety pe people in there, that's going to be impossible. Crime. We just recently had a neighborhood get together. You know, the, in the neighborhoods they have this meet the neighbors. And uh, we invited the uh, police department to come over. And we had about seven or eight police uh, officers there at this function. And they were just wonderful. We got to meet them. We got to talk to them. We got to be friends with them sort of thing. And then they had a fabulous little question answer session. And one of my neighbors asked point blank, what happens in neighborhoods when a change this drastic happens and a building like that goes up? And the policeman looked at her straight in the face and said, when the population goes up and the number of cars goes up, crime goes up. What does that have to do with safety? If that's an important issue to the city of Lakewood, I want to know how safety and crime rates going up are equal. They are not. So I know you have a tough job. I, I can't imagine doing your job. It would be beyond me. But all I can say is we are depending so much on you for our safety, for our lives, for our homes, that we implore you to make a big heartfelt decision when it comes time to make a final decision on that site plan. Because if that building goes up, it's going to change the neighborhood, it's going to change the people, it's going to change our lives. And it's hard for me not to cry right now because it, it, it touches my heart deeply. So I know that this new building can bring good revenue to our city. And I think that's a good idea to bring revenue in. But my question to you is, is Yarrow Street and Belmar Park the right place for that? And quite honestly, right now, I pray for our safety. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So we'll go ahead and go to the online, bring you over, and looks like Mr. Thermosguard, you have your hand up. Just let us know your address or ward, and we'll get your time going. Just remember, that's your 30 seconds, and then you'll hear that twice. Good evening. Hello, can you hear me, City Council? Yep, we got you. All right, my name is David Thormansgard, and I'm a Ward 3 resident coming to you live from the house I rent with my friends behind Lakewood Link. I greatly appreciate all the amenities that are available to me in the Lakewood Commons area. I run through Belmar Park weekly with the Runners to Roost um, runners every Thursday. I check out library books from the library there, and I'm looking forward to biking to Cider Days this summer. These are opportunities that not many people in Colorado or elsewhere have, and I think we should be doing what we can to make these amenities as available to as many people as possible. What better way to give people an appreciation for these things than to give them access to them? Think about it. It could be 420 or 412 families with kids who can grow up with a library in their backyard and a beautiful park that they can learn to enjoy and protect. It's a shame that so many kids have to have a car to get to the park nowadays. This apartment could be an opportunity for all of them to have better access to that. I'm sure as a community, we come together and work with the developer to address these concerns in a way where this development could, could um, contribute positively to the 
park and to the community, right? We saw this with the HOA and the city staff in Denver West Partners last week, how they worked together to address the complaints of the community in a nearby area of the potential um, car dealership, the snow removal, the traffic lights and road development that would all actually bring a positive impact to help the community that is around it. Um, and as for the safety concerns, um, on, I volunteered with the uh, Larimer County Dive Rescue Team for a year when I was up in Fort Collins. And uh, in my time that I got to train with them, I, I was able to train alongside some of the first responders with Pooter Fire Authority. And I got to see some of the amazing work they do. And I have every, all the faith that the Metro West Fire Protection um, Group is at the same level. And I think they could protect our community. So bottom line, I think we can all work together to address these concerns and have this apartment contribute to a place that is a positive change for our community and moves forward. Thank you for listening. And I hope you all have a wonderful Monday evening. Great. Thank you. Anybody else online wish to speak? Go ahead and raise your hand, which is star nine. Going once, going twice. All right, we'll close public comment. Thank you everyone for uh, coming out, taking the time to uh, talk about some very important issues in our community. I'll start with the weeds at Carmody. I think that will be noted. And I know that we've also, in some areas, have had some great compliments of the mowing this season, but we've had a lot of moisture and uh, sometimes hard to keep up with the contracting, but we'll look into that. Um, the Love Lakewood Day is gonna be a really cool thing. I'm glad Miriam, she already left, but I think there's a lot of great opportunity there uh, as we go forward in our clean energy Lakewood people. We always do love your passion. And I know that many on this council have been talking with staff. Staff is looking at these different opportunities. Um, sounds like some of this stuff will flow through the state of Colorado as well. So we're trying to figure out the best way to, to move forward with these things, as well as the Lakewood Advisory Commission is doing a study on uh, retrofitting and things along those lines. So quick summary on that. And then I would just say, you know, certainly crown jewel of our community is our parks. Over 25% of our cities because are parks. Order. There is nothing that allows the mayor to comment on uh, public comment. You're where actually the out of out. order, Councillor, so we're not going to go ahead and do this. So what I was going to say is that um, somebody who walks that park every Sunday morning as well, we certainly understand the concerns, and um, I think there's also some misinformation out there. We need to make a vote Counselor, on my point of order. You're out of order, and I decide the point of order. And you're out of no, order. No, the council. Okay. So. There is nothing that allows the mayor to comment and not the rest of council on public comment. And I make a point of order that we vote on whether this is permitted. So I'll hear your point of order because I judge on that, and I'm going to rule that you are out of order. I comment on every public comment. For I appeal eight that years. point of order okay. and ask for a vote of council. So I, I think you might be off on your Robert's rules. The calling the question would allow for a vote of the council. This isn't a question. This is just summarizing what everybody's come here to talk about tonight. So I have noted your point of order. There, there and, is nothing that says okay. the mayor has more. So councilor, I'm gonna either recess the meeting. Authority to. Okay. To address public. So I'm just going to go ahead and continue and say council. that there is a spot on our website we that you're able to go to if you wish to learn more. And if you just we go to the lakewood.org website and you go to planning, it's listed under 777 South Yarrow, and you'll see all the documents. Address. And I would also just mention that Councillor Stewart has been engaged with some of your neighbors for over a year in discussing this. And so I'd encourage Point you to continue order. to work with Councillor Stewart as I you move for forward. But we are sensitive to that. 
order? At this point, there's nothing that comes back to city council for a vote, I for a but I would encourage you to continue to work. So on my point that's of my order. quick summary for you. And for a quick explanation for our friends here, point of order on Robert's rules is when somebody requests that point of order. The mayor as the, not, as the presiding order, officer. The mayor cannot. <laughs> All right. Legal counsel. So. Yeah. I wish our Boy Scouts were here because we talked a lot about what public comment looks like. So. Just so what I would say is after every public comment, we don't engage. We try to address the topics that were and just give a high level summary, whether it's a staff follow up on weeds, whether it's the folks who've come out about 777. That summary there. is not from the mayor. All right. So um, what we're going to do is, again, quick point of order. I was giving you a summary. There's a calling a question, then we take a vote of the body to call the question. There's no question before the body right now. So I would encourage you once again, continue to work with Councillor Stewart to move forward and have these concerns and the conversation. And certainly our planning folks are here listening as well. Okay? So thank you. Okay. I'll now ask for... Item seven to be read in the record. Item seven, resolution 2023-48, directing city staff to comply with proposition 123 by filing an in necessary commitments to increase the city's affordable housing stock by 3% annually or by 9% by December 31st, 2026. So before you start this, um, I am actually going to take a five minute recess to 840, please. So we'll come back at, uh, we'll come back in five minutes.
Okay, we will reconvene the Lakewood City Council meeting at 9.13 p.m. This is the September 11th meeting, and we are moving into agenda item seven, which is resolution 2023-48. There is a staff presentation, five comments on Lakewood Speaks and a presentation that Mr. Parker will give, and then we do have a public comment period. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, Travis Parker, Planning Director. I'm joined by Amy Dietnicker, uh, who is our Housing and Neighborhood Support Supervisor, as well as uh, some long-suffering members of some other organizations, Mo Miskell from DOLA, Jill McGranahan, and Brenda Lee Connors from Metro West Housing, who are all here to answer your questions at the end of the presentation, if you'd like. Uh, so as background, uh, housing affordability continues to be one of the most pressing challenges facing Colorado. In 2022, Colorado voters approved Proposition 123, which is making hundreds of million do uh, millions of dollars available to local jurisdictions on an annual basis for affordable housing. Uh, the funding will be made available to local governments and nonprofit organizations to increase the supply of housing units. And for Lakewood or any nonprofit in Lakewood, such as Metro West Housing, to be eligible to apply for these funds, the city must file a commitment with the State of Colorado Division of Housing to increase its supply of affordable housing by 9% per year over the next, or excuse me, 9% total over the next three years. And the commitment is due by November 1st. Uh, the state estimates that the fund will generate $160 million in the first year and over $300 million annually beginning in 2024, with funds becoming available later this year. The funds will be split, it, split with 60% of the funds going to CHAFA to establish programs related to equity investments, debt financing, and land banking, and 20% going to the Division of Housing to establish programs related to affor affordable home ownership, homelessness, and to increase local government's capacity to administer these programs. The funds will be allocated to organizations through programs meant to address a variety of housing needs and development challenges. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, funds will be made available to acquire and preserve land, develop new units, preserve existing affordable units, create home ownership opportunities, provide resources to prevent and respond to homelessness, and to increase planning capacity to create expedited affordable housing review process. As a prerequisite to accessing these funds, local governments are required to make two commitments. The first commitment is to increase the supply of affordable housing units by 3% per year over the over the coming three years. City can commit to either doing it 3% per year or as a total of 9% over the three years. The second commitment is that by 2027, the city will have established a fast track review process for affordable housing development projects. Uh, this is still to be defined um, and we have some time to accomplish this goal. In order to meet Lakewood's 9% commitment over three years. The total uh, number of housing units produced by 2027 would have to be 475. This equates to 158 units annually. Uh, this simple timeline shows where we are now. Uh, last November, the voters approved this uh, proposition. In August of this year, a month ago, uh, city staff submitted a letter of intent to uh, participate in the in Chaffa's land banking program. And tonight we're here uh, to request cal council's uh, approval of a resolution directing staff to file a commitment with the state to participate in Proposition 123. Um, once that commitment is made, um, we can begin implementing and those funds will become available to Lakewood and, and Lakewood nonprofits. Um, and we'll be uh, implementing that over the next three years uh, between now and December 31st of 2026. So the resolution before you tonight uh, would direct staff to file this commitment with DOLA, would allow staff to submit any letters of intent that would be required to participate in any of these programs, and would commit staff or would direct staff to apply for any Proposition 123 funding available to, to increase the city's affordable housing supply. I will sit down and Great. all of the people that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation are available for your questions. Thank you. Um, and I would like to just reiterate, maybe, Mr. Rob, I'm, could you read this into the record just in case we did not? Item seven. Sure. Is it seven? 
Yeah. Yeah, please. Item seven, resolution 2023-48, directing city staff to comply with Proposition 123 by filing all necessary commitments to increase the city's affordable housing stock by 3% annually or 9% by December 31st, 2026. Okay, the public hearing is open. We do have two folks that have signed up. And again, there's five comments on Lakewood Speaks. So first up is Pastor David Hensley, then Mr. Comden. And if anybody else wishes to speak in chambers, please do so if you wish to speak online, please raise your hand, star nine. Hmm? Okay, let's see. Go ahead, we'll get your three minutes going. There yeah, you're good. Good evening again. I rise to vociferously support our city's adoption of this resolution. We in Lakewood desperately need to unlock this funding made available by Proposition 123. There are countless stories among us and in our city that would affirm the urgency and the desperate need for us not to leave a dime on this table when it comes to funding that can unlock the development of affordable housing units, the purchasing of land for said housing, and the funding of services for people experiencing homelessness to help them stay off of the streets. Wherever one might stand on our city's growth cap debate, one thing I have heard consistently from both sides is that we need more affordable housing. Affordable housing does not happen on its own. That has been proven by the minuscule amount of affordable housing currently being developed in our city. But to be clear, there actually is affordable housing being developed in our city in my war too, as a matter of fact. Despite what I have heard some say on this dais and in the broader conflict our city is having over our approach to housing policy and all of those conversations. Our city staff has worked tirelessly on a comprehensive housing study for Lakewood that identifies the work we have before us and we'll be looking at that a few months from now. Friends, we are in an economic and humanitarian crisis. And while this funding from Proposition 123 would go a far distance in curbing our homelessness crisis, it would also allow us as a city to focus on being a place where one can both live and work. Our city should be a place where people can start and raise families. Our city should be a place where people can afford to retire. We've got to get ahead of the development that props up housing solely for the sake of making money. We've got to get ahead of the housing development scarcity that defines the Denver metro area and which drives costs of living and the value of housing, which leads to astonishing tax rate hikes for our residents. We need to start supporting efforts to develop housing that is less about making money and more about making uh, and growing our community in strategic and sustainable ways. Not strategic by limiting growth, I should say, but strategic by guiding growth. And it must begin with robust efforts to develop affordable housing, first and foremost. Committing to a measly 9% increase of affordable housing over three years is more than doable, especially if those partners in our city can come alongside the vision. There is absolutely no reason to vote against this resolution. It is money sitting on the table that nonprofit partners in our city and affording affordable housing developers need to have an edge in the challenge that comes with developing the kind of housing our city needs. It would be an insult to the capacity of our city for any one of you to say that the modest requirements of Proposition 123 is out of reach or impossible for us. Building that apartment on Yarrow Street would cover the whole 9%. This is a necessary solution out of so many to address homelessness. This is funding that helps us create a city where people can live and work. So please vote in support of this resolution. Thank Great. you. Great, thank you. While Mr. Comden's coming down, I'll just remind um, council and those who are online or on the phone that this presentation is on Lakewood Speaks and has been for 10 days as well. So if you want to follow along, you can go to lakewoodspeaks.org. Mr. Comden, good evening. Hello, yeah. I, I don't really have much to add what Pastor Ben said. I think he covered everything, but I just want to basically iterate that like this is money coming from the state that the voters voted on and said that they want to be used towards this specific thing. I think it would be reckless if we did not utilize the resources that were there and available for us to use. I hope that building more affordable housing can be a, another prevention tool to keep people from making their way to the street and needing to eat some of my chili, although I think it's wonderfully delicious. I think it would be better for people not to have to go to that those uh, circumstances. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Ms. Menton? Anybody else in chambers? Okay, we'll go to online as well. 
or yep, any online or call in if you have a comment. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. My name is Natalie Menton, Ward 5. So I want to talk a little bit about the big picture, and there really is uh, some concerns, uh, questions that arise from what are we doing with housing in Lakewood. And it stems with different parts to this puzzle that are in works, and not all of them are on the table right now before this body. As an example, the Planning Commission right now is looking at a zoning rewrite of ADUs. We don't know how that impact will be on our city. House Bill 1255, which was uh, removing limits on um, strategic growth, whatever we may want to call that, has been cleared. Uh, we've got Polis coming back with potentially um, another version of the land use bill, 213, which could come back in pieces. And there was a lot of opposition to that. Lot, lot, lot never seen it's been a long time since i've seen just strong opposition but that piece is coming back we don't know what's in the works there we've got proposition one two three which is really tied to two one three um and two one three was a heavy-handed inappropriate bill being forced down the throats by governor polis but we don't know what's in the works for this next session Will something like House Bill 1190 be presented, which would have basically forced a property owner to sell their property to the government or have their property held up for months over a sale? Let's move to, with the force of fifth potential $50,000 penalty if somebody did not comply with the land use or with the government right to buy property, which was in House Bill 1190. So let's then talk about the calculations, because I did not hear those addressed in the presentation. Um, the staff memo says 625 subsidized units, yet the video we just watched shows 475. Why are the numbers not the same? Why is there not a number in the resolution? I think it should be the 475 based upon the spreadsheet which was produced by DOLA which I don't know how the numbers were, were come to, but, but there's a difference, there's a discrepancy. There is other problems involved with Prop 123. One is the fast tracks permitting process. How is that going to affect the folks who are not subsidized and struggling to get their building permit or changes through the process? Now they'll be pushed aside Let's look at the property tax impact. We have a property tax problem, big problem, coming in January, regardless of HH. Less people will be paying property taxes under one, two, three, yet services will be the same. That shifts the burden to those who are paying property taxes. Those are the concerns, those are the reasons that people should question Prop 123 and the commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers? Okay, anybody online? Okay, I'll pl close public comment. I'll ask for a motion, then we'll go to council comments and questions. I move for the adoption of resolution 2023-48. Second. Motion is second. Councilor Shares, aye. Um, yes, thank you. I'm excited for the opportunity to vote on this. I think that it's a critical piece of um, unlocking funding available. You know, there's not a person up here, I think, who would disagree that we need to invest in affordable housing. So those who would advocate against it, I'm, I'm quite unclear on why you would do that. But I do have a question um, based on our last public comment. Could you share a little bit about the numbers in the staff memo versus what was in the presentation? Yes. The, um so the numbers have been a moving target as, as this program has been developed. Um, so we've been through several iterations of numbers and the staff memo numbers just uh, were one iteration ago and weren't corrected. Um, the, the ones in the presentation tonight are the, are the most recent and correct numbers. Councilor Jansen. Thank you. Can you 
remind me what those numbers were? I uh, the six was it six twenty five that you said or four seventy five? No, it's four hundred. Sorry, do you have those? I do. Sorry, Amy. <laughs> yes, um, it is uh, four hundred and seventy five over three years, or one hundred and fifty eight units per year. Could you introduce yourself, please? Pardon me, uh, Amy Dignicker, uh Planning, Housing, and Neighborhood Support Supervisor. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, uh, so when, when was the last time the city took a hard look at the fees and the burdens caused by the city that added to the cost of a development that might not be necessary, like a review committee? We, uh, development fees you're speaking of? Yeah. Yeah, we look at development fee fees every two to three years and come to council to update those every two to three years. We keep our development fees at or below the cost of, of actually reviewing these pro projects. So they're based on the, the cost of city staff time in reviewing these projects. Okay. So um, Prop 123 is going to add government subsidized housing without paying property taxes and leaving those who do pay property taxes to cover the gap. So I will not be voting on this resolution only because of that. I wanna help protect the property owners that are paying property taxes. They've seen a huge increase in their property taxes. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Stewart. Uh, yeah just wanted to voice public support for this. I'm really, really thrilled that we are going to be accessing these dollars um, and happy to vote for anything that's going to increase housing affordability in Lakewood, um, you know, help to uh, support services for folks experiencing homelessness and make sure that we're also supporting um, affordable pathways to home ownership. I'm confused and I apologize if this was covered but I am unclear as to the property tax question is there a reason that someone who purchases a home affordably would not be paying property taxes I don't believe so these these projects would still be subject to property tax okay cool yeah that was that was certainly my follow-up because and we do have our folks from Metro West Housing here, and I'm not sure that might be different as the housing authority with property taxes, but this, these dollars are open to private developers and other folks that are willing to do this. So I'm getting a, a nod from the state as well. So, yeah. Okay, Councilor Springsteen. Holy cow, I'm having to participate by audio only because the mayor decided he didn't like what I had to say. Wow. Councilor, do you have a, so, do you have a question, this, please? Thank you. This is a major, major violation of all of our open meeting laws and so forth because I can't see the presentation. I can't see what's going on. I'm trying to participate as best I can uh, by audio. Um, uh, this is absolutely not acceptable, but um, anyway, with respect to what's being said, um, I think, uh, well, I don't know. I'm just completely off my game right now. I'm going to have to circle back around, but I mainly wanted to say that I, I can't, I'm not able to, to participate effectively this way. And the city is effectively keeping me one of the city councilors from participating in this meeting effectively. Um, 
and I'm able to show that on my video that I can't get on by Zoom because of what the mayor did. Okay, so I'll just reiterate that this is on Lakewood Speaks and has been. Um, so if you want to take a second and review, you're more than welcome to. So I would just say that, you know, certainly this was set up by the residents of Colorado to have this opportunity. And I don't think it's perfect. And I think there's probably some statutory changes that we'll continue to see. But I think this is one of the best tools that we have available to us um, for a true kind of diversification of funding that will allow for better opportunity for um, affordable housing projects to be developed. And so I'm excited to support this um, in our role as Metro mayors. Last year, we supported this even with some questions, but we know how critically important this is and important to our mission uh, in our city. And one of our uh, key goals is to look for better ways to address affordable housing. So if there are no other questions, oh, uh, Councilor Jansen. So I just wanted to ask again, so Metro West does not or does pay property taxes on their properties that they? Ms. Connors, if you want to. Thank you. Hi, Brenda Lee Connors with Metro West Housing. So uh, Metro West Housing is a housing authority and the Colorado state law is such that if a housing authority is in the ownership of an affordable housing development, then we do not pay property taxes. Um, but as other people have noted, private developers, even if they're affordable, still would pay property taxes. Um, potentially even nonprofits if they don't have the housing authority in the ownership. Okay, thank you. okay, thank you for that, Ms. Connors. Please cast your votes. Councillor Springsteen, aye or nay? I'm not quite sure how I'm supposed to cast a vote. Aye or nay? Nay. Okay. Can we please? All right. And that passes seven ayes, two nays. The nays being Councilors Jansen and Springsteen. Primarily because I can't see anything that's happening right now. Okay. Will the, okay, so let's see. The use of the consent agenda has been made to expedite council action. It contains both resolutions and first reading ordinances. Resolutions are items of a routine nature. Members of the public will have an opportunity in a moment to comment on any of the proposed resolutions. First readings appear uh, for on the agenda only for the purpose of setting future public hearing dates and ordering the newspaper publication of the proposed ordinance. No public comments will be heard this evening. On first reading ordinances, the public will have the opportunity to comment on the proposed ordinances during the scheduled public hearings on the date set tonight by City Council. Any council member may request an item on the consent agenda be removed for separate discussion and action under general business. Will the clerk please read the consent agenda for the record? The consent agenda includes items 8 through 16, item 8, resolution 2023 49, approving the 2024 budget for the Alameda Corridor Business Improvement District bid. Item 9, Resolution 2023-50, approving the 2024 operating plan for the Alameda Corridor bid. Item 10, Resolution 2023-51, approving the 2024 reappointment nomination of Ed Boyle to the Board of Directors for the Alameda Corridor bid. Res item 11, Resolution 2023-52, approving the 2024 reappointment nomination of Patty Denny to the Board of Directors for the Alameda Corridor bid. Item 12, Ordinance 0-2023-37, adopting Title VIII, Chapter 1 of the Municipal Code of the City of Lakewood, Colorado, to allow for the use of approved facilities as overnight shelters during extreme weather events within the City of Lakewood, Colorado. 
Item 13, Ordinance 0 2023 38, adopting Title 14, Chapter 28 of the Municipal Code of the City of Lakewood, Colorado, in connection with establishing a public improvement reimbursement program to allow developers of privately financed construction the ability to apply for and obtain partial cost recovery from subsequent users of the public improvements. Item 14, Ordinance 0 2023 39, accepting the devolution of certain property from the Colorado Department of Transportation to the City of Lakewood and approving an intergovernmental agreement to affect such property devolution. Item 15, Ordinance 0-2023-40, incorporating certain real property into Municipal Ward 1 boundary for the City of Lakewood, Colorado. Item 16, approving minutes of the City, city Council meetings, uh, Special City Council meeting minutes of August 7, 2023, City Council regular meeting minutes August 14, 2023. Okay. so. I'm going to go ahead as requested by Councillor Jansen to remove items 8, 9, 10, 11, and 13. 13 can only be pulled for a separate vote as it's a first reading ordinance. So I'll ask or open the public hearing on the consent agenda for resolution. There is none. So just item 12, 14, 15, and 16. So the motion would be to adopt on the consent agenda, agenda items 12, 14, 15, and 16. I move to order all ordinances 13, oh wait, or ordinance 2023-38 to be introduced on first reading to be published. Nope, nope, nope. nope. So um, your motion, and I think you could just say so moved is to, um, you make a motion to pass the consent agenda consisting of items 12, 14, 15, and 16. And I think you can just say so moved. So moved. Second. Okay, motion and a second on um, items 12, 14, 15, and 16. Any discussion? Please cast your votes. Councillor Springsteen. No. I mean, is any of this legal? Okay. No. All right, so the consent agenda passes eight ayes, one nay, the nay being Councilor Springsteen. So, Councilor Chairs, uh, your light is on. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Is that possible? Um, well, we have a motion on the floor. I just voted. Okay, so that would just leave us with... But we need to set the public hearing for item 13 and 14 and 15. We just we voted just on those. Or, uh, no, I'm sorry, item 13, forgive me. I thought that was part of what we voted on. No, item 13 was pulled. I think if we're going to have further conversation, given some of the difficulties tonight, it just may make more sense to adjourn. But okay. if there's not a second. A second. Oh, no. Okay, well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Just make sure. Let's see here. Mayor Paul, we do have our city attorney joining us yeah. remotely and she can um, advise accordingly. Th there is a bona fide motion and a second on the floor. So I guess what we would have to do is just figure out, a, we'd have to move these to a date certain, but if Ms. McKinney-Brown wants to weigh in. Uh, Mayor, as you, you've stated it correctly, that the action at this point, a motion to adjourn uh, when unqualified is always a privileged motion, except when um, 
its effect would be adopted, would be dissolve the assembly permanently, which you're not doing. So it is a privileged motion. Um, however, because you are a city council, you would have to uh, also state when you will be retaking the matters pending before the council. The open motion would be tabled to whatever date that the adjournment was moved to. So it can't just be a motion to adjourn. It would have to be a motion to adjourn to a specific date. It can be the next meeting in two weeks or what, if, if you would like, but you need to specifically state a date that these matters will be revisited. And I would love to know who gave Councillor Sherazai that tip to make a motion to adjourn. Councillor, I'm doing it on your Can behalf hear me? in an effort to allow you to fully participate. So I hope that you see this as an opportunity for us oh, to yeah. table the conversation yeah. until you can I'm fully sure participate. On my behalf, Councillor Sherazai, who, who gave you that idea to make that motion? Can so I'd like to amend body? my motion to uh, adjourn this meeting to a date certain of September 25th. Who, who, who told you second, to make that motion? Okay, so we who have a um, motion. Because we're going to get to the bottom of it. So we have a motion and a second her, to adjourn this meeting. And that will then take all the remaining items and move them to September 25th. All right, please cast your votes. I want to know who made, who told Sarah Zaye to make this motion. So, Councillor Springsteen, I vote. again, Councillor Sherazai requested to speak, made the motion, and it was seconded. That's what's on the floor. What we're gonna get to the bottom of that in Cora because we're gonna Cora her her text messages tonight. Yep. Who made? Certainly that appreciate that. Is your vote yes or no, please? Vote. Yes or no. No. Okay. So if somebody could do that vote. Okay, that passes. Eight ayes, one nay, the nay being Councillor Springsteen. And we will reconvene the rest of this agenda on the 25th. This is a kangaroo court. Uh, all right, thanks.